Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar this evening, which is the final event of a three part series exploring the topic of autism as experienced by autistic women and girls. My name is Jessica K. Doyle, I am, and I am an autistic researcher with a strong interest in the areas of autistic perception and sensory processing. I work as an assistant psychology psychologist at the adult autism practice, and I am a committee member on the PSI autism special interest group. This event is brought to you as part of St. John of God's Research Foundation's Learning Exchange series of St. John of God's of St. John of God Research Foundation, in collaboration with the Autism Special Interest Group of the Psychological Society of Ireland and the Psychology Department of Lucina Clinic Services. This evening's event combines some pre-recorded and live presentations. Throughout, you can submit your questions and comments through the Q&A button on the, top, on the bottom of the screen. Please use this option to submit anonymously if you do not want other attendees to see your name or if you are sharing personal information. At the end of the presentations, we will hold a live panel discussion with our contributors and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag AutismWebinar and make sure that you tag us at PSI Autism SIG and at Research SJOG. If you require CPD points from the PSI, please email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie after the event. We will have a, com a couple of comfort breaks throughout the session, so you will have the time to stretch your legs. We will do our best to keep this to time and hopefully it will all run as smoothly as possible. Can I remind you, please do not share your attendee link with anyone else. The event is completely booked out and sharing your link would mean that someone who is registered for the event will miss out on their place. We are recording this event and the recording will be made available publicly online. Details on how to access the recordings can be found in the booklet for this event, which you received by email with your attendee link. Now, without further delay, I am delighted to launch proceedings and welcome our first speaker, Elaine Chapman. Elaine is a library assistant. Elaine does presentations and study for work to making libraries more accessible. Elaine helped to set up the Ability Network in TU Dublin. The network aims to link the students and staff and give them a voice in the university affairs when needed. Elaine is also autistic. Elaine's talk will focus on accessibility in academic workplaces and how improving this will improve many professions. It will cover universal design for learning as well as accommodating sensory, physical and social needs. It will also cover the struggles of neurodiverse staff who are working from home, what can be done to help them and what benefits the pandemic may have had for disabled people in work. There we go. Um, thanks to Jessica for inviting me to do this talk. For those of you who don't know me, which is most of you, my name is Elaine and I work in the Library Service in the Technological University of Dublin, which will henceforth be TU Dublin. This talk will look at ableism in society and academia and how changing that will benefit many workplaces. It will do this through examining intersectionality, universal design, academia and more. I think I'm going to start straight off and tackle academia's known elitist reputation. Many academic institutions have the reputation of being ivory towers, places that are metaphorically cut off from the world, where those who excel academically can go pursue their various interests, except the ivory tower imagery also brings up another connotation, that of a defensive fortress that only a select few can enter. These fortresses can stand tall, strong and stubborn in the changing world around them. Arbury is, after all, not a substance that breaks easily. And that is what needs to happen if we wish to continue to improve accessibility in society. The towers need to come down. I believe this is starting to happen at a TU Dublin. Our aim is to become the most accessible university in Ireland. We have work to do, but we will get there. And accessibility does not just refer to disabled people. It, re it refers to making academia accessible in every way to single parents, those in poverty, disabled people, people from minority ethnicities, those who work, those who can only attend distance classes, and more than I'm sure I can't think of right now. If you want to create and maintain a reputation for excellence, then we need to, to enable the best people to get here. And they can come from any strata of society. 
TU Dublin is in the unique position of being a brand new university. As an autistic member of staff, this has meant that I have had the opportunity to be involved in creating our new Ability Network, an informal forum for disabled staff, students and allies to come together to discuss issues arising in the university, as well as helping to advise on its developing policies. TU Dublin's strategic plan for 2030 uh, for 2030 is using the motto of infinite possibilities and the three pillars of that plan are people, planet and partnership. As part of stressing the importance for of all people in our community, the university aims to build a campus that supports all styles of learning and supports equality, diversity and inclusion for all. But we don't just want our disabled staff and students to be, feel that it, they are being included just for the sake of it. We want them to feel like they belong. There is a saying by Verna Myers that I'm sure many of you know. Diversity is being asked to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Belonging though, that's being able to be in charge of the party, to have your input respected and heard. With regards to the subject of belonging, there is a saying used throughout the disability community, and that is nothing about us without us. It is rebelling against the fact that services are usually designed by able-bodied people, often even without consulting those with disabilities. It tackles the lack of consideration for disabled people in the design of public services and spaces. Uh, disabled people are often the last to be considered in the design of a service or space, and this can impact heavily on their ability to interact with society. There needs to be a cultural and societal change to challenge this lack of accessibility. This is where employing disabled staff can step in. When giving the right, given the right support, they can help to pinpoint issues in the services that many workplaces provide, provide. I believe that the system of universal design created by the architect Ronald Mace is something that we need to look more at, both in terms of our buildings and our services. What universal design essentially does is that it encourages the design of buildings and services to be both aesthetically pleasing while being accessible to everyone, uh, regardless of age, ability, race, sex or gender. Um, it takes to heart the needs of our citizens most in need of access and uses them to create the design. I suspect many of you are currently sitting there thinking you've signed up for a talk on neurodiversity in the workplace. So why are you hearing so much about disability in academia? The truth is that with the way our society is currently structured, they are heavily related. If we want our society be, to be truly inclusive, the neurodivergent people need to be able to reach the top in our respective work, workplaces. No glass ceilings for us, thanks. Now, realistically, many workplaces now ask for undergraduate degrees as a minimum requirement from potential staff members for entry level jobs. And for higher up, they often require a master's or more. When our education, education system is so hard for so many to succeed in, are workplaces really getting the best applicants for these jobs? Just for example, disabled people can be experts by design with regards to mental health being impacted by their disabilities or by the inaccessibility of society. But most will never get the chance to contribute to a field like, field like yours as they will have dropped out of school or college because this system will not adapt to meet their needs. This is also a problem with regards to service design, because how can we give input if we struggle to even get into the field? Uh, in what ways can we make professions such as yours accessible to those who don't do well in the cur current school system? Uh, programs like DARE are limited by funding, so maybe there needs there need to be some projects coming from the individual professions. What and how are not questions that I have the answers to, unfortunately. Many neurodivergent people experience barriers like this throughout their everyday lives, and that is without necessarily having other intersectional identities. I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but for those who haven't, intersectionality, a concept coined by Kimberley Crenshaw, is also an interesting concept of relevance to service and workplace design. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities 
combined to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. Uh, examples of these aspects are gender, sex, race, class, sexuality, religion, and disability. For example, there was a recent study wherein 70% of the autistic respondents were LGBTQ+. For them, this could mean that they are negatively impacted by society, both because of being autistic and because of being LGBTQ+. Universal design ties heavily into improving workplaces for intersectional people. Many believe that universal design applies only to disabled people, but that is not the, ca the case. For example, Google recently came up with a program for Google Assistant that allows it to read out online articles, which is obviously great for people who struggle with visual impairments or are blind, and, but it also translates them to other languages in real time. Uh, this makes online articles accessible to a much broader range of people than if a physical book would be. If you wish to test and learn more about making your online resources more accessible to your staff, web accessibility in mind, known as WebAIM, is a good website to start with. You can check, te check text, test, text accessibility, including by its color contrast checker, and is a fantastic mine of information on digital accessibility. Another good tool is Microsoft Office's own accessibility checker. Found under Check Accessibility in the Review tab in many of its programs. This will perform an inspection on Word documents, PowerPoint, and Excel for accessibility related issues and provide steps on how to solve them. In addition to these, when pre preparing online resources for your staff, implementing audio description and closed captioning for videos, as well as alt text for images, are relatively simple actions that improve accessibility. Uh, with so many of us currently working from home, accessibility of online resources and communication has become increasingly important. That is especially true for neurodivergent staff. I'm sure many of you know how much harder it is to have Zoom meetings all day versus in-person meetings. This is not to say that in-person meetings are easier for neurodivergent staff, as that may not be the case. Um, but the social signals that we have learned to survive in the workplace are now either gone or much harder to read. I'm sure I'm not the only one who never knows when to hang up on an online meeting. Having a set structure for online meetings, such as finishing by a specific time, having agenda items, etc., just as you would for physical meetings, can be a great benefit to all of the attendees. <sighs> Communication is not the only struggle that neurodivergent staff face when working from home, though. For many of us, our routines have been completely, completely upended, and we are now relying more on our own ability to plan out and ex execute tasks. Uh, for neurodivergent staff, however, this new lack of routine and increased autonomy of work can actually be a struggle due to something known as executive dysfunction. This makes establishing our own routine and the planning out and execution of ta tasks quite difficult. Just to give one basic personal example, I might decide at 1 p.m. one day to go for a walk, but it might take me until 2 p.m. to actually leave the house. Not because I was busy, but because I've had to put my boots on, find my jacket, find my hat, get distracted by my phone so I misplace the hat, find the hat again, get distracted by the dog, and then I eventually leave. Now that's, that's fine when my task is just going for, for a walk, but when it's work, it's a different story. And that's without the added stresses of the pandemic. Some practical supports for neurodivergent staff can, can be to arrange regular check-in meetings if, as, or when they feel they need the support. These meetings would not have to be long or intrusive, but more of a checkup on what the staff member feels is working and what is not, and what can be done to change things. A variety of formats for meetings such as these is also preferred. For, an exa for example, an informal chat or over messages, such as via Teams or Gmail, uh, could be better than a video chat for some staff. For that, that said, for many staff, working from home has been very positive and it is something they wish to continue into the future. 
I'm not sure how many of you know this, but disabled people have been requesting the ability to work from home for years. But for many of us, we were told that it was not possible. Suddenly now that business is needed, it has become possible. Uh, for that possibility to be revoked would be a disaster. Working from home often means less sensory, social or physical stresses for disabled staff. It means no com commute on public transport or by mis busy motorways. It means we can work on high pain or low executive function days as we are not having to expend a lot of energy just in getting to work. It can improve staff morale as it shows employers are willing to be more considerate of individual staff members' needs. Uh, when, this, when the type of work is possible to do online, does it really matter where the staff member does it from? We insist on people coming into offices and that is just generally because it's what we're used to, and it's entirely possible for staff to work from home and be supported in, do, in doing so. I'm going to end with a quote from a former boss of mine, Sarah Ann Kennedy from TU Dublin. When I first became a manager, I had limited professional experience in supporting colleagues with neurodiverse needs. I'm always very conscious that living and working with a disability is not my lived experience. While I could, access guidance in various policy documents, guides or research. Being able to speak with and directly learn from colleagues within the neurodiverse community is, has been inv invaluable in helping me become a better manager, colleague and ally. I am indebted to, to my colleagues' openness and willingness to share their experiences and help me learn how best to support them and make our workplace a better place for everybody. And that is really the key. No matter what, no matter what marginalized community you you are working with, uh, find members of it to listen to, promote their voices, and better your service by doing so. Uh, thank you all very much for listening to me. Thank you to Elaine for kicking off our event with that interesting and thought provoking talk. We look forward to hearing more from Elaine during our panel discussion later. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, Claire Gleason. Claire is a senior occupational therapist and researcher who has been working collaboratively, collaboratively with the autistic community for over 12 years. She has a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Therapy, a Master by Research in Occupational Therapy specialised in the area of autism and leisure occupation, occupations from Trinity College Dublin and a postgraduate advanced certificate in education from Queen's University, also specialised in autism. She is currently conducting PhD research exploring the experience of autistic women in navigating the world of work within an Irish context. She lectures in the area of autism and has worked with and continues to work with autism organisations. Claire also holds the position of Practice Education Coordinator in the Discipline of Occupational Therapy in Trinity College Dublin. Claire's talk will explore the literature that exists in relation to employment and autistic women. It will touch on how the voices of autistic women is truly essential if we are to change the narrative around employment. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction and good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening um, to speak on a topic that I suppose I have been involved with and been doing lots of research in over the last number of years. I'm going to start with a quote from a very, very wise woman. Um, when we were discussing about understanding the needs of autistic people, and it was that it was, if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And this evening I'm here to talk about my experiences as a professional in working with the autistic community. Unlike the other speakers, I don't have lived experience of autism, but what I do have is an opportunity to try and understand about the experiences that autistic girls and women have and try and incorporate that into my work as a professional occupational therapist. Without these experiences or the, the experience to engage with this with the women, I truly would not be able to support them um, in providing the, the service or occupational therapy engagement that I provide. We can have all the um, 
background and degrees in the entire world but truly it is about understanding the needs of the person that we are working with and seeing them as a unique individual to try and support them in particular this evening as we talk about engaging in the world of work and the world of employment. Furthermore, I've had the opportunity to be involved with um, not only supporting people through um, occupational therapy, but also in developing um, internship programs for um, autistic people and supporting autistic individuals in the transition from um, college uh, into employment. So I'm starting kind of this evening with this image of um, what it's supposed to represent as potentially journeys in navigating the world of work. So what I want you to think about is to think about your journey. You know, maybe you're a professional on this webinar this evening um, and maybe you are a mother or maybe you are an autistic woman. And we all experience our journey into employment very, very differently. There are various twists and turns and U-turns along the road. And ultimately, our journey isn't one linear direct pathway where we know exactly where we want to go. And if you're a professional, I want you to really consider that as you work with autistic women and girls in supporting them enter into the workplace or supporting in neurodiverse individuals in engaging in employment because there is no one set rule for all and each individual will have their own unique experiences. Likewise, this image is to represent the broad spectrum of autism. And when we talk this evening, we're talking about autism and neurodiversity and every individual is unique. You know, maybe you're the person who likes swinging on that swing and getting vestibular input, or you're the person who likes to jump up and down on that trampoline. We each have our own unique needs and strengths that we bring to the workplace. And when we think about the autism spectrum, it's very broad with individuals who have specific support needs and strengths along that spectrum and we need to consider that as we talk about employment because there are various different facets of employment whether that be full-time employment part-time employment supported employment you know, we really have to consider there are various different aspects to work so really tonight, I want to kind of share with you a little bit about the context of employment and work. And I suppose my uh, my talk is really about focusing on kind of what do we what do we know, what do we need to know. And I think the idea of tonight's evening is very much about we're listening to the voices of autistic women in sharing their experiences of the world of work and neurodiversity within the workplace. And really, that is the starting block of where we truly need to go if we are to really consider how we can support individuals in engaging in employment and getting that a message of awareness out there to ensure that people can engage in what is a human right, a human right to work. And employment, as I said, can take on so many different facets and we can experience a work and employment in lots of different ways and can be defined in lots of different ways. It can be full time employment, of paid employment, voluntary work. It can be part time work, working within the home. Um, and so when we really consider in in, in employment what we're really looking at is is we're talking about employment begins to emerge in transitionary stages in life in particular maybe it happens during late teen years it happens during early adulthood or throughout adulthood and Elaine referred to the idea of ivory towers and societal expectation around how employment works and if we think about society we're hearing lots of in the COVID-19 world about the leaving cert and we think about that that there's a kind of a transitionary expectation of society that we engage in secondary school go on after our leaving cert to potentially engage in college PLC courses, further education and enter employment. But we know having, you know, working with the autistic community and the neurodiverse community that that isn't always the case. It, it doesn't always have to follow this linear stage approach. There is often what people experience is tran periods of transition and change. And when we talk about employment is that we 
periods of transition happen throughout the lifespan for every individual, whether they engage in a new job, a change of career, that the person returns to education, the person takes a leave of absence and returns into employment. And each of these transitionary stages brings about a sense of crossroads, um, a sense of change. And we need to be very mindful of that as we talk about employment. Going back to this idea of this societal expectation of engaging in the education and going into employment, we need to be mindful when we think about um, young women at the age of 17, 18, trying to make decisions associated with future work and employment. I think if you think back to your 17 year old self, did you really know what you really wanted to do in life? And we put this expectation on that people have to have a sense of understanding. It's very complex of knowing what we want to actually do in you know our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s and 60s. And as employment and our pension age begins to increase, we're going to be in the world of work for a very, very long time. We know when we look at the research is, is that employment is often said to be an um, ambition for all individuals as they enter into adulthood and engage in adulthood. And that is no different for the, for the neurodiverse community. Unfortunately, within Ireland, we really struggle to understand the numbers of people um, uh, from an employment context. And sometimes what we have to look at is, is we have to look at the broader context of employment. And Elaine referred to it in her presentation there about um, the disabled community and when we look at the literature um, in relation to prevalence and incidents and percentages around employment and unemployment we do have to look at that literature. What we do know in Ireland is, is unfortunately people with disabilities are less than half as likely as people without disabilities to be employed and a recent report in 2009 showed that we really have one of the lowest employment rates for people with disabilities in the EU, which is really something that Ireland has got to get to grips with um, in terms of really beginning to, um, to li limit this kind of liminal space for individuals. Ireland has one of the highest um, gaps between people with and without disabilities when it comes to employment. And this is despite massive advances, advances that we have had in legislation over the years. But what we do know is, is that we've had an increased access to programs such as DARE in terms of employment, in terms of education, but we still really have a far way to go. When we look at autism and employment, we know that really that from all of these webinars is that there's been an increase in the number of individuals gaining um, a diagnosis of autism in the last number of years. But what we do know is, is that unfortunately less than 10% of autistic people are in an employment, mostly as it states in low paid jobs. So when we look at the literature, it can tend to be a very negative picture of employment. And what we really need to try and do is open the, 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 our, our eyes as professionals and individuals to see that is it really this negative and do we need to really explore um, those experiences that people have. We know that employment enables an income and improves quality of life. It can promote independence and engage and participate in interests or support somebody to get impact on their health and their well-being. But when we look at the research is, is that we see that many individuals are still struggling with employment outcomes um, in the general research. Unfortunately, when we look at the research of what we do know is, is that we know that autistic women are completely underrepresented. And this is really unfortunate because the research and the discourse is truly male dominated. Um, you know, we really struggle that to see um, how women, autistic women are being represented within the literature and their experience that they're having. What we do know is, is that the research, the autistic research community are really calling for more research to be conducted 
with autistic people rather than about them and that's a real need that we have currently existing because what we do know is is that there is a growing body of literature that's currently reporting of the very poor literature that does exist is is that women are less likely to be employed compared to autistic men and we don't know if whether gender is impacting on this specifically um, and is that because of general gender or is that because of specific areas of strength and challenges that the women are presenting with. What we do know is, is when we look at some of the research that has been conducted, of which really only one article has ever really differentiated between the experiences of autistic women, is, is that we see that autistic women in this study conducted by Baldwin and Cosley identify that women have a very high educational attainment. But what is currently existing is, is that the women are either being employed or they're underemployed. And what we mean by that is that their skills and their qualifications qualifications um, don't necessarily match up to the skills of the job. So their qualifications are potentially far exceeding what the skills are required of this particular job. And it's a real aspect that we really need to start considering. What we do know is, is that of the women that were unemployed um, in this um, this study was that 56% wanted a job with a preference for part-time employment. And this is a really interesting concept that we need to start exploring is, is that employment, as we said, does not necessarily always have to be full-time. As I said, one paper has differentiated in a systematic review, differentiating women from men when they're presenting their findings. But what they did find was is that the women experienced underemployment, unemployment and difficulty in maintaining employment. We don't know again when we start looking at kind of gender and societal expectation as whether gender kind of begins to become an issue because of um, pay gaps, which generally exist between um, men and women and parental responsibilities. But what we do know is, is that basically looking at this literature, that nothing exists focusing on differentiating women from men or understanding the true experiences of autistic women within the workplace. And so with this void, we really are struggling to understand where we can actually go. What we do know is that autistic individuals and autistic women have incredible strengths, um, including high quality work, trustworthy, honest, they have a desire for employment, they're ambitious and are incredibly reliable. And what we do know is, is that employers are beginning to really understand these strengths um, and are developing initiatives in terms of supporting individuals within the workplace. But what we must be mindful of is, is that mantra that we need to remember that individuals don't always necessarily want to engage through autism initiatives in terms of employment, but want to engage in work on their own merit. One of the aspects that um, I have experienced over the years in working with women is, is this idea of disclosure and reasonable accommodation. And one of the challenges is for autistic women is, is that autistic women often get a late diagnosis and therefore they have a lack of support in managing um, this disclosure process or reasonable accommodations. So disclosure is a process by which we need to inform um, employers about disability. And going back to even what Elaine said earlier on is, is that that direct learning from people that all of the employers can read everything in policies and booklets, but really it's about supporting individuals to support them in their disclosure of a disability within the workplace, which seems to be a particular void at the moment in terms of how we can support people. There are so many reasonable accommodations that can be provided for individuals um, to fully do their job and engage in equal employment opportunities. And it's about just understanding what are those reasonable accommodations by teasing them out with the person in order to ensure that they have success within the workplace. We know that there are many challenges that do, that do exist, um, in particular managing the whole interview process, but in, in also looking at employment from the process from the start to the finish. And what we really need to do is to support individuals to build a sense of understanding of what their challenges are in order to support their disclosure. 
A recent report that was conducted by um, Simon Harris um, was about reviewing Irish healthcare services for individuals with autism. And what did come out of this was that we need to really consider how the HSE can work with adults to support them in terms of education, employment. And so therefore seeing this is an important first step in trying to see how the services can develop to support individuals engaged in employment. I suppose my phenomenon that idea is, is this iceberg phenomenon. And if you're a professional, sometimes you will begin to read the literature and see the literature and have concepts or um, myths around autism. What's really important is that we sometimes, what we see and therefore think happens at the top, but what we truly need to do is to get to know a person in order to truly understand what their experiences are and see what lies beneath to truly support them in engaging in employment. At the moment, I'm currently, um, as Jessica said, working with a number of women and um, conducting in-depth interviews to explore their experiences in navigating the world of work. This is one of the first types of research from an Irish perspective, which is truly going to allow us to by finding and bridging that gap in the research that currently exists within an Irish perspective. And hopefully this time next year, I'll be back to share with you the really interesting findings that are emerging from the study. I know my time is up, so I'd just like to leave you with some of these parting thoughts. No two people may want or require a similar suite of supports. We need to be person-centred in our approach if we are to truly understand how we can support a person to engage in employment. We also need to think about building a therapeutic rapport with individuals. Don't create ceilings for individuals. We need a strengths-based approach demystify our views of what we currently know and learn from working with individuals rather than always just reading the information and gaining that information. Individuals with autism have immense potential. However, we can often be the stumbling block as professionals in terms of supporting them in reaching their potential. So I would say what's really, really important in moving forward is, is that we consider how we truly can support individuals to reach that potential. Many thanks. Thank you for that splendid talk, Claire, and we look forward to going further into some of the topics you have raised with our panel later. That brings us to our first break this evening. During the break, you may wish to submit a question for our panel by using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Please join us back here in five minutes when we will hear from the remaining, remaining presenters. I am pleased to welcome you all back and hopefully you had enough time to grab yourself a cup of tea. I am now pleased to introduce our next contributor, Kirsten Hurley. Kirsten first discovered the world of autism when she was diagnosed as a young adult and since then has studied, volunteered, worked and researched in, in this fascinating field. She has been involved in autism studies in University College Cork since the first offering of the course in 2013 as a tutor, a lecturer, and formerly program coordinator and is currently the project coordinator for the autism friendly university initiative in ucc she is also a guest speaker on the ucc doctorate in clinical psychology program and has a particular interest in the experience of girls and women women who are autistic can you see that okay i'm assuming yes okay um so when I was first asked to speak on this topic, my initial reaction was, this is brilliant, this is fantastic, um, we'll be raising awareness of autistic women in employment, brilliant. But then as I started to kind of research what I was going to do for my presentation and think about the kinds of things I wanted to talk about, it started to make me feel quite uncomfortable. So I was thinking about why is this the case? Why is this so uncomfortable? And I suppose because it's a deeply personal situation. Like I am an autistic woman in the workplace and thinking about that requires reflection on my own challenges and uncomfortable situations I've been in. Um, and also the importance of employment um, to me personally, well, it's important to everybody really, but to be able to pay my bills and feed my kids and I have three of them and they use a lot. So this is really important. Um, and I'm currently, you know, the one who's working full time, my husband is a carer at the minute. So there's a lot of pressure on, on people to remain in employment. 
Um, I'm also quite aware as well of my own quite privileged situation. So I received a diagnosis of autism when I was in college. So I was able to complete my degree and go on to postgraduate study with supports that recognized the challenges that I had as an autistic woman. Um, and I now work in a field where my diagnosis is very relevant and also very helpful, which isn't the case for many people who are on the spectrum. And also, I suppose I feel a sense of responsibility that um, when you are speaking about your own experiences as an autistic person, that A, that you're helpful and that you're also aware of the challenges and the suffering, to be quite frank, of a lot of people who do have a diagnosis. So hopefully this will be helpful for people. And just to stress as well that um, when I'm talking, I'm not saying that employment is essential. We're not saying that you have to be or need to be in employment if you're autistic. And that we have to recognize that a lot of the comorbidities alongside a diagnosis of autism, especially anxiety and depression, can be at a level where someone is unable to work. And sometimes that cause is actually from work. And that the priority is that you have a certain level of wellness so that you're able to function. But if someone who is autistic wants to work, how can we make that happen? And I think there's a collective responsibility that we all share in making that happen. So looking at autistic people in employment in general, um, as Claire referenced, unemployment and or inadequate employment is a significant problem for adults with ASD. And this is despite having largely high formal qualifications. So people with um, undergraduate or postgraduate qualifications can still strip if they're autistic can still really struggle to find work. Um, and according to a survey that was done in by the National Autistic Society in the UK in 2017, just 16% of autistic adults are in full-time work. And according to DCU, there are at least 15,000 unemployed autistic adults with third level qualifications in Ireland. So what about autistic women in employment? So the Hayward, Hayward paper that Claire referenced as well um, showed that autistic women wanted somewhere they could fit in and they wanted a stable work environment, but they had low expectations around finding suitable work for themselves. Um, autistic women are less likely to have a diagnosis and therefore are less likely to be able to, well, they're not able to, recon to access recognised supports and the legal protections that come along with having a diagnosis in the workplace. And then there's also the societal kind of impact of the fact that there is less awareness of autism in women anyway. So kind of social leeway that may be forthcoming from colleagues and management for a man with autism, even if he doesn't have a diagnosis, they may well recognize autistic behaviors in someone and make adaptations on an informal basis, but not recognize that a woman has autism and make those same kind of accommodations. So we can't talk about autistic women in employment without mentioning at least autistic mothers in employment. And that's a picture of my young guest, which I had to put in there to show them off. Um, so it, some autistic women will become mothers and working mothers have an additional load on top of the challenges of employment. They often have to negotiate the two roles. And if you're autistic, understanding some of the unwritten rules around being a mother in the workplace, can be difficult. So for example, I never realized that sometimes people use sick leaves for themselves when they their own children are ill. Like it's almost like an, an unwritten thing that you can do that. Um, some autistic mothers as well will have children who have <laughs> autism. And we, we know that mothers are more likely to be carers and they're more likely to be expected to reduce their working hours or even to leave work to care for children. And they're often the main point of contact for services as well. So if you are an autistic mother in employment and you have your own autistic children, that is a, um, a huge workload to negotiate and manage. So when we talk about autistic women in the workplace, um, it's not just STEM or IT. Like I think there is a lot of kind of focus around autistic people working in kind of computer jobs. And it's important to recognize that not everyone with autism is particularly interested in STEM or IT, never mind be very good at it. Um, yeah, the, this picture in, the third picture in with the, the cup of coffee on the MacBook, I had to leave it in there because I just thought 
if you have autism and you're using a laptop, often people have motor co coordination difficulties as well. So if you're going to put a cup of tea on a MacBook, things can go very wrong. Um, I've actually done that myself. But um, yeah, just to, to highlight that, that is not a good idea. So what are the challenges around getting a job if you are an autistic woman? Well, the job interview um, can be a big hurdle for all autistic people. There's the issue of disclosure. How do you disclose before an interview that you are actually on the spectrum? And the last interview that I did was the first time that I'd ever disclosed before an interview that I had a diagnosis, and it was for a role that was specifically to do with autism. And it was really helpful because one of the interview interviewers actually came out and spoke to me um, beforehand and explained where everyone was going to be sitting and what was going to happen. And it really helped kind of calm my nerves about it. And it probably would be helpful for everyone, but it was particularly helpful for me um, because I do have a diagnosis of autism. Uh, I think it's important as well for people with autism to recognize that people do apply for jobs even when they don't fulfill all the criteria. So if you're looking at a job description from a very literal point of view you can rule yourself out of jobs that you could actually get and um, so just to flag that language choice in interviews saying open-ended unstructured questions like tell us about yourself um, are very difficult questions to answer so interviewers need to take a bit of responsibility around that and there are things that you can do to make the interview more successful which are often kind of unsignposted so I found out that you can actually ring up HR and find out in advance who's going to be on your interview panel. And then people do bits of research around who's going to be on the panel and practice what they're going to say, which I was astounded by when I heard you could do this. But there you go, there are these kinds of unwritten things, unsigned posted opportunities that if you do have autism, maybe you're not as aware of. So the challenges of keeping a job, um, something that's come through quite strongly in the literature is that, um, Autistic people can have very low self-esteem, especially around their abilities in employment. And there's a paper by Casey Maris and it's Al, oh, I put an E instead of an A, anyway, um, that they make a lot of ne negative comments about themselves. So if um, an employer hears this, they may well interpret that in a different way than the person means it to be. Um, and people can have poor working memory and auditory processing issues. So obviously, this is this can be challenging if someone's supposed to follow instructions, um, having motor issues, motor coordination difficulties, so making notes and writing quickly. And then, of course, the whole social communication difficulties. A lot of um, work involves um, communication between a manager and an employee, and there can be difficulties there. And there's this one phrase in the paper which I absolutely loved, which was a reduced, that people with autism can have a reduced concern for reputation management. So basically they, they care less what people think. Um, and I just, I love the way it was phrased. So if you want to think about if someone is in a meeting and they're um, trying to follow instructions and take notes, like all the, the different challenges that are kind of coming together in that situation to, um, kind of dictate the success of that particular meeting. So the types of employment can be a challenge as well. Um, Claire alluded to this uh, about working full-time. It's not the case that everybody wants to work full-time, but it is a case that part-time working is more common for women than it is for men. And then we have these zero-hour contracts and temporary contracts, which I think can be quite anxiety-inducing and give a feeling of insecurity to people which um, if you are autistic, you can worry more about these kinds of things. And that can then in turn affect your job performance. Um, and it's always important to consider the sensory environment of the workplace. Like is there loud noises? Are there strong smells? Open plan offices are a bit of a nightmare for that kind of thing, being able to concentrate. And then I came across this case study of a professional autistic relationship. And in that this particular article, they, they talk about the problem of double empathy, which is a kind of area of research in autism where it's not just about the person with autism themselves having an impairment in communication, and that's where the difficulty lies. There's actually um, an issue with the way 
the people without autism are interpreting um, the person with autism's behaviours and communication. So it's very much um, a two-sided kind of issue rather than just an issue that lies with the, the person with autism. Um, and you can Google it. It's um, employers may discriminate against autism without realising. And I have a quote from it here. Um, so in it, he describes about... Um, this man who was having difficulties at work and then the manager was really responsive and, and really thought they were doing everything they could to support this autistic employee. But it had emerged in meetings that the autistic employee would often misunderstand what had been said. And in response, the employer had stressed they had no problem with the meeting being stopped if the autistic employee wanted to ask a question or clarify a point of discussion. But this is a problematic assumption because the autistic employee might have not even realized there was a misunderstanding until much later when it had become a problem. But even if he had recognized in the moment that there was a misunderstanding, it shouldn't be assumed that he would be immediately able to speak up. So I think um, like we're all aware of the communication difficulties that someone with autism can have. Being able to kind of recognize a problem and then articulate that in a socially appropriate way very quickly would be very challenging for a lot of people anyway. And then when I was doing this um, kind of reading around, I thought I'd include, include this quote because I don't know if you've had this experience, but when you read a quote and it's like they've just gone into your brain and actually taken out what you were thinking and put it on paper and it, it's quite uncanny and unnerving. But um, this particular quote is from a book called Knowing Why, Adult Diagnosed Autistic People on Life and Autism. And it's, it's really good, actually. So I recommend that you go and look it up or buy it. And there's a chapter on autism and work by a woman called Kelly Braun. And she's describing how difficult she finds it to be balanced in her work. So she's either completely hyper-focused on her work or she's overwhelmed and then is unable to work. Um, okay, so overcommitting had led to feelings of panic and overwhelm. When she had too much on her plate, her brain goes into overdrive and then executive function issues start to rear that ugly head. She becomes overwhelmed and she doesn't know what to do or even where to start. Then she gets upset with herself and uh, fears letting everyone down. And then this has resulted in bosses telling her that she's an inconsistent performer because she's either over delivering because she's hyper focused and in her stride or she's doing the bare minimum because she's overwhelmed. So just to kind of reflect on those two quotes, that there will always be challenges for autistic people in the workplace, but they can be addressed with work from both sides. It's the responsibility of both people. Um, it may be difficult, but this is probably an ideal that we should be striving for. So just to quickly talk to some potential accommodations, working from home, um, I think it was Elaine said, like we've been told you can't work from home, you can't work from home, suddenly COVID happens and we can work from home. Um, and not COVID working from home, this is not kind of normal working from home. Um, we don't usually have our children at home if they're supposed to be in school, that kind of thing. So um, just to stress that, um, having a workplace mentor to ask a question, answer questions can be really helpful. Using AT to help with planning and time management. Um, something I think it would be brilliant is this recognition of unwell days. So, you know, to take a sick day, you have to get a doctor's note. But for people with autism, they can often have poor interoception or not realize that they're physically ill or the level of illness that they're experiencing or be very, find it very difficult to recognize their own levels of stress, stress and emotion. So being able to have that it's okay to take a day if they just know they need a day and not have to justify it um, would be really helpful around kind of managing yourself at work, more freedom around timing of breaks, uh, flexible start and finish hours if possible and sources of support. Uh, having a mentor at work, if they're familiar with autism, that would be great. Um, getting opportunities to hear positive feedback and encourage a person to reflect on their achievements because research has shown that people very often don't realize that the things that they're doing good at work unless someone actually says it to them. There are specialist employment agencies, um, but if you are in college, work with your career service. Like We're really lucky in UCC to have a really good career service that looks at um, supporting autistic students but this is something that students need to do when they're in college kind of set themselves up um, and to end on a positive note 
and there seems to be much more general the much more understanding amongst the general public so that's including employers as well I think even in the past five to ten years and um, being autistic in the workplace it's it's definitely a better situation than it was there are better sports in education and training although we have to recognize there's still quite a high dropout rate for autistic people um, in, in education and in training. And then th there's been an increase in adult advocacy and self-advocacy, which is showing what is possible. So even this um, webinar, I think three of us have a, a diagnosis. So you know, being able to see successful autistic people at work is um, a really positive thing. Okay, that's me. Thanks. Many thanks for that fascinating presentation from Kirsten and a good point on the coffee. I agree, it's not advisable to have liquid anywhere near a MacBook. Now, I am delighted to introduce our final speaker of the evening, Tara, Tara O'Donnell Killen. Tara is a practitioner research with a Master of Science degree in Applied Positive Psychology and Coaching Psychology and over 20 years experience working with diverse groups of people across the globe. She has held a lifelong interest in social justice and human rights and is the founder of a new social enterprise called Thriving Autistic, where she is building a global team of neurodivergent psychologists, therapists, coaches and allied professionals who support autistic adults to thrive. She is herself an autistic woman and parent to three wonderful autistic children. Tara's presentation tonight will discuss how psychologists and psychologists and allied professionals can support neurodiversity in the workplace. Okay, I'm assuming that you can hear me and see me and see this screen more importantly. Um, thank you to the PSI for the opportunity to talk tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you to St. John of God's Research and particularly thank you to my fellow, fellow panelists. You're all amazing. And actually, as I watched each piece, I thought, gosh, I can go home. <laughs> you each of you have said everything. It's, it's just beautiful. Um, okay, but I shall move on anyway and, and see if I can contribute anything. Um, as Jessica kindly introduced me there, um, I'm an autistic adult, but I'm also a professional. So I straddle both, um, I, I straddle both fields there. Um, at the moment, having, having founded last year this new collective called Thriving Autistic, and the idea behind it is a, a group of neurodivergent therapists, psychologists, coaches, speech and language therapists, and we have an occupational therapist too, um, supporting each other to thrive. And I think as has been already mentioned in, um, in other people's talks, a lot of the time we, and particularly if we're mothers, can't work full time. Um, so it's wonderful to have this opportunity to start off a social enterprise where we can support each other while supporting autistic individuals too. Um, we have been um, partnering lately with, well, since its inception with the wonderful adult autism.ie, which is an Irish practice um, that is a mixture of neurodiverse individuals, psychologists, all clinical psychologists, as far as I know, um, who are diagnosing adults in Ireland and in the UK. So what we do for them is all the post-diagnostic support um, for newly diagnosed adults with As I Am, which is Ireland's, one of Ireland's top autistic charities. We have been um, working with them, providing some team support for team members and also um, working on community webinars. And we've just most recently started a partnership with Specialist Earn where we will support um, third level graduates from when they leave college to, to turning to specialist turn where um, just in terms of career guidance and figuring out what are their strengths, what would be the kind of roles that they should go for and that would really suit them the best. Um, then finally, we are building out a portfolio of neurodiversity training for both professionals and companies. So what I thought was, um, given that this is just a 15 minute presentation, um, and I'm not used to talking for only 15 minutes. Uh, the best thing I could do was kind of distill it down as into, into three sections. So what I'm going to do is the first section is talking about what is the utopian idea of what a neurodiverse workplace would look like. Um, and then the second section is about, well, what are the barriers to that? Why is that not happening? What's the problem? 
And the third part is about how can we as professionals support this utopian future for, from, from coming sooner rather than later. So hopefully that will be clear enough. Um, just a couple of stats, there's no point in going too deeply into this because they've been all brilliantly covered already. But what is a neurodiverse workforce? Well, well you're in one already because 10 to 20% of the work workforce is, is, is apparently, you know, at some, some levels neurodivergent. And 50% of people, up to 50% of people don't realize that they are. We're finding the majority of our clients at this point, about 80% of them are late identified adults. What could an intentionally designed neurodiverse workspace look like? And this is a workspace that would support the needs of everybody, of all neurotypes. So I have a little video that I'm hoping technology gods will, will play. That's the utopian ideal for if you were working in a workplace and, and hopefully in the future, that is what we're going to get. Um, but as has been alluded to earlier, people, autistic people and neurodivergent people work in all sorts of settings. But wherever you are right now, regardless, simple adaptations can help. And others have already actually explained this in so much greater detail and better than I will. So just briefly to say, you know, natural light. Um, we can move a desk closer to the light. We can consider either wearing noise cancelling headphones or moving to somewhere, moving a desk to somewhere where it's where it's more quiet. The temperature of your surroundings and the uh, the ability to access a private space, either a private office or um, private moments, uh, you know, a group, a workroom where it's privacy and people can go in and take time when they need it. Um, again, staggered breaks can be so useful for people working in buildings with others that if they, if, they're, if they need that quiet time. Um, and again, I think it's already been said in that video, but true inclusivity means that we must provide workspaces that accommodate the entire sensory spectrum of sensitivities. And as has been said, you know, there are the stereotypes obviously about autistic people, um, but each person is an individual and has an individual collection of sensitivities and needs. Then not only talking about the environment, but, but internally, you know, on the person's um, emotional well-being and their psychological well-being, we need to build on their strengths. There's a whole, I could spend a day talking about strengths because there's a, a whole um, a whole wealth of research has been done on strength-based or in the workplace or in the life place. Um, but absolutely, the autistic people in particular and neurodiver many neurodivergent people, including ADHD, are well known for having um, what's called a spiky profile where they're extremely strong 
oftentimes are extremely strong in some areas and in other areas can find real challenge. So um, the traditional viewpoint in business has been to focus on, on fixing weaknesses. Um, but that has been proven to be an ineffective use of time and energy. And I'm not going to go into that more deeply yet. I wish I could, but we don't have time. Um, so I'm going to move on to now the barrier. Like what is stopping us from achieving that utopia in, in, in the world right now? And I'm giving you a content warning. This is especially for um, any neurodivergent people here, professional or personally here, that this next video is there is some distress in content. It's talking about ableism and it's by the United Nations. It's only a few, two minutes, less than two minutes. But I think it's really so vitally important that, that I want to show it to you. What is ableism? It is a form of discrimination based on a value system that considers certain body and mind characteristics essential to living a fulfilling life and assumes that the quality of life of people with disabilities must be very low. In ableism, like in racism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression, dominant social groups project their own image as the model for how humanity should be, rejecting or ignoring others as inferior, not normal, or unfit. This bias is used to justify their exclusion, sometimes even their extermination. One example is the eugenics movement, which emerged in the early 20th century and resulted in the forced sterilization of more than 60,000 women, men, and children with disabilities under the pretext of improving humanity's gene pool. In Nazi Germany, more than 300,000 persons with disabilities were exterminated because their lives were considered unworthy. But despite the scale of these atrocities, ableism continues to spread and its significance remains little understood. Ableist social views still shape our understanding of what it means to live with disabilities and how the lives of people with disabilities are valued. Thousands of women and girls continue to be sterilized against their will, and many more persons with disabilities spend their lives confined in institutions, prisons, or at home, and deemed to be incapable of living in the community. Ableism underpins the way our societies are organized, Basic daily activities, such as going to school or work, taking public transport, doing groceries, or practicing a hobby are made difficult, if not impossible, for persons with disabilities and end up excluded and isolated. Human rights challenge ableism and other forms of oppression and fight for a world where diversity is valued and embraced. Humanity is always changing. People everywhere use their minds and bodies in different ways. And those differences are what makes us stronger. Human diversity is all around us. We are all part of it. Let's embrace it. So just take a breath. That's a reminder to me too, but for all of us, because it's, um, it's so big. It's such a massive piece there and it underpins everything. Um, it's been brought up, it started, Elaine, Elaine started with this and, and it's been a running thread throughout tonight's presentation. And it really, it, it warms my heart, I have to say, and it gives me such great hope to see how much this is on the table because otherwise what we're really doing is just looking at window dressing. And we can't do that. We need to make a real difference. So thank you again for being here and for bearing with me. And I'm apologizing again if that was distressing um, and I'm sure it was for, for many people, but it's just down to how important I think it really is for us all. Now, moving on to the concept of minority stress and neurodiversity applied to minority stress and the five factors of minority stress. So I'm thinking about neurodivergent people here as a minority, a neuro minority. And we have experiences of discrimination and prejudice. We have expectations of rejection. We have to continually make decisions about disclosure or concealment and the cost of both. We have internalized stigma or negative views of one's own identity because of being brought up in a society that is ableist. And then we have the whole coping with these experiences. Then when we look at autistic women and girls, 
in the workplace, they also have to deal with intersectionality, which um, Elaine, I think it was mentioned earlier. Um, so not only do they have all of that minority stress, they also have sexism and misogyny to deal with. And then if they're um, a member of another intersectional, uh, another minority group, they have that on top of it as well. So, you know, this is where we're at right now, that all of this still exists. What is the solution? What can we do? What can we actually do? And what can those of us here tonight who are really resonating with this and hearing it and wanting to be part or actively working towards a solution, what can we all do? Um, this quote from Dr. Nick Walker. In terms of discourse, research and policy, the pathology paradigm asks, what do we do about the problem of these people not being normal? Whereas the neurodiversity paradigm asks, what do we do about the problem of these people being oppressed, marginalized, and poorly served, poorly accommodated by the prevailing culture? And I believe that gets to the nub of this and the nub of the switch in paradigms that is happening in real time. I feel like we're living through history right now. There are two very different paradigms. On one hand, the problem is inside the person. On the other hand, the problem is an external. When we look at mental health challenges up until very recently and still in quite a lot of cases, the pathology paradigm would say, well, that's inevitably linked that a person who's autistic is bound to have mental health challenges. Nobody's denying in the neurodiversity paradigm that people can also have mental health challenges. But what we're saying is it doesn't need to necessarily be the case. We have minority stress and we have environmental causes to deal with. There's a colossal amount of trauma in the autistic community. And one of the um, sayings I continually hear is that it's very difficult to, un to, to know what an autistic person looks like who hasn't been traumatized. So how do we help neurodivergent people succeed at work? So really simply, again, because it's a 15 minute presentation and in my longer workshops, we go into this more deeply, but we need to provide a supportive sensory environment. We need to help them to work to their strengths and we need to reduce minority stress. What three things can anyone here tonight decide to implement today? Well, number one, you can reflect, we can all reflect on internalized ableism. Number two, you can listen to autistic voices. Go out and find autistic researchers. And number three, empower neurodivergent professionals. Hire them, mentor them. There are so many neurodivergent psychologists coming through at the moment, and they all need assistant psychology posts. They need mentorship. They need to be supported and listened to and not have to hide because 10 to 20% of people in the workplace are already neurodivergent and a portion of them will be autistic. So you may not know it, but they exist. We're all around you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for listening. And if anybody wants to contact me, there is my email address. Thank you again. A huge thanks to Tara for sharing her experience with us in that wonderfully intriguing talk. I am pleased that Tara and all our speakers are joining us very shortly for a panel discussion where we will try to address some of the questions that our audience have sent, has sent in. Before that, we will have another five minute break to refresh. Welcome back everyone. And it's now time to delve deeper into some of the issues that we raised during the presentation and highlighted by our audience. Um, can we get all speakers to turn on their camera and turn on their sound please? So, the first question I'll start with is directed at Claire, but any of our panelists can answer too. Claire, how can you help an autistic female in the workplace? And what is your experience with self-employment and autistic women? I think uh, everyone can answer that question, but I suppose just my experience so far is, is that a lot of autistic women engage in self-employment. It seems to be that, again, it goes back to individual preference and choice in terms of what people decide to do in terms of their career progression. Um, but certainly self-employment is a pathway or a journey that people tend to 
want to pursue for lots of different reasons, like we talked about, you know, um, being moms and the challenges with being a mom and trying to navigate flexible working hours and childminders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with the fact that, you know, we know that more and more people um, due to often autistic burnout maybe want to work on part-time basis and sometimes the flexibility that is provided through self-employment actually um, can be a huge positive for individuals and um, but again that's just from my experience I, I can see that there is more uh, individuals wanting to engage in social innovation and enterprise that is currently existing and there seems to be more information out there in the employment world about that potential for for self-employment. Would anyone else like to contribute on that question? I suppose um, I'd just add that um, the lack of structure, if you're self-employed, can be quite difficult to manage. And I think that can be a shock to people sometimes that, you know, if someone else is in charge of your starting times and your finishing times, it's a bit easier to kind of manage the day. But then again, you know, being able to have that flexibility is really helpful. So definitely don't rule it out. Just be aware there might be challenges with that. Yeah, I, I find as well that it depends on the personality, you know, as, as, as we've all said, every autistic person is different. Lots of autistic people like to have that um, ability to set their own schedule and then lots who really don't who want to be told exactly and have that tight structure. So it really depends. Great. Thank you. OK, I'll go on to the next one. Um, do the panel think there are any skills that may be specific to autistic people? that make us particularly good employees? I think empathy could be a good one because contrary to the general stereotype, I find a lot of autistic women have huge amounts of empathy for other people, um, especially like their colleagues or their sort of clients or users. I like, I'm not really sure how to explain it, but we can often get a good understanding of their problems, even if we haven't actually been through them. Like it's like our own experiences of oppression can give us a bit of a better understanding than someone who hasn't experienced it at all. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Elena. I find autistic women can make brilliant therapists, really brilliant, because um, We've had to spend so much time learning neurotypical speak, <laughs> first off, and really learning how to empathize, how, 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 how the different neurotypes work. And we're also can, can um, have the ability to really focus in on the person and forget about ourselves and really be present in the moment. And that's, you know, really helps develop um, a therapeutic alliance. And then also, as you said there about like we've experienced a lot of oppression and that minority stress can really help with the empathy with feeling you know connected with another human being suffering in their experience yeah okay that's all very good points uh next one again is for tara and um, or is this one is for tara and um, hi tara i am an slt so speech and language therapist currently working with an 18 year old female who has recently been diagnosed with autism what sites would you recommend I direct her, her family to her and her family to? Also, any tips, support groups for beginning college life? Thank you. Um, that's a big question. First off, I think definitely connect her in with the autistic community. If she hasn't already found them, she'll learn so much there, and her family will too. Um, Facebook has some fantastic groups and also ones to, to steer clear of, but ideally try and find ones that are run by autistic people. Get on Twitter search the hashtag actually autistic or ask an autistic and you'll find loads of people there to ask questions of. Um, I'm sure others have great ideas here as well. Anyone else want to hop in? I think the other thing is to consider um, if the person is where the if the person is 18 and are they going to think about further education and things like that. And I think you can think about the universities have developed, you know, ambassador programs, um, you know, specifically around trying to demystify, demystify this kind of transition to college or, you know, what is the challenges associated and that idea of that you've just had a recent diagnosis, understanding that and how is that going to, you know, does, does that, you know, challenge you in terms of access to college and things like that. So if you think about 
Trinity. Trinity have um, the ability co-op. Uh, certainly in, I know Elaine, you might be able to refer to TUD, but you know, there's lots of different, um, various different support services that are actually there for people and um, that are, you know, autistic, that are the voice of autistic people. So that I think they're the kind of um, avenues that we need to consider for somebody who is, you know, of that age that they're hearing their peers. And that's really important because peer hearing or hearing the voice of our peers is much more uh, is has influential ultimately than maybe listening to professionals or listening to parents or whatever the case may be. So really, I think it's about um, broaching that subject of listening to other listening to others of our own age because that I think is most powerful for people. Um, you know, for people who are trying to understand. And it's a, such a challenging time as an 18 year old as well, you know, to, to, to really begin to understand where life is going as well. And so therefore having our peers is going to be a benefit. And um, just to say as well, on a very practical note, a number of colleges have adapted the Autism and Uni Toolkit. Um, I know Trinity has it, DCU has it, uh, UCC has it, that if you just Google Autism and Uni Toolkit and then the relevant um, institution, the, the colleges have put a lot of work into putting a lot of information about the transition into university on those toolkits and you can go on and you can see the experiences of autistic students who have been um you know first years postgrad mature student that kind of thing so um the, the feedback that we've got from our one in ucc has been really good it seems to be something that's that's very helpful for people i i will say as well there's also organizations like aspire I think they used to do a mentorship program where they're the say the 18 the 18 year old autistic girl would be able to get mentorship from a slightly older autistic person who's been through whatever it is that she's going through that they could be something to look at and they also used to do, used to do a um social group for young autistic people but I don't know if that's carrying on at the moment with, with COVID. I think it is, yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks for all those great And answers. I hop in with one tiny extra thing. <laughs> this is not specifically to the students, but it's just because I know it's a great opportunity. We've loads of university um, lecturers and people here with influence to do something. I work a lot with professionals who are either also either lecturers or professors. And I'm not saying just in Ireland, I'm saying across Europe. And um, what I am noticing is that we can have great, um, we can have great different facilities and accommodations for the students, but we forget that our colleagues, there's a percentage of our colleagues that are already autistic. And then they're coming to people like me saying, I'm work, I'm in this, and all our, my students are getting all this great support, but I'm not, and I'm afraid to disclose. So I think it would be fantastic to see some initiatives put in place in all our colleges for your staff. Yeah, I actually had that um, com a very similar conversation with a group of Trinity postgrads recently. Um, not, sorry, not not meant to take the college there. Um, they basically said that a lot of the resources are aimed at undergraduates, but not taking in, say, postgraduates and staff, like their needs and their um, actually how important that the represent, representation of having them there is for the undergraduate students as well. So yeah. when you're supporting your staff and your and your postgrads, you're supporting the in, incoming undergraduate students. Yeah. And you know that you really do have a safe workplace if mm -hmm. in your university that you've got staff members coming forward as well and being prepared to be a representative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um... Now, the next question. Um, did I skip a question? Um, I think I did. Uh, did I read this out already? Where can I learn more about disclosure and reasonable accommodations from an autistic narrative perspective? No, I already did. Sorry. Um, confused. Okay, sorry. Can an autistic person be helped with social interactions so that they may understand, may be understood better by other people? That isn't interesting one mm -hmm. um does anyone have 
any feedback on that? Or maybe we should be looking at like so many thoughts. Like. Back. <laughs> yeah. We going to say something? <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. Research is showing that between groups, there is a problem. There's a problem with communication between neurotypical people and autistic people. But within the groups, neurotypical people have no problem communicating with each other on the whole, and also autistic people have no problem communicating with each other on the whole. This is newer research. And so it really, I suppose, asks us then to um, have a look and maybe reframe how we've been considering social communication skills and social communication skills training um, and see that perhaps it has been a case of the majority neurotype has been classed as the ideal and the one way and everyone else has to fit that or be deficient. And so again, I think this just brings us back to the collective responsibility we all have that the more knowledge we have and the more reflecting we can do on internalized ableism and see how we can create a new future where all neurotypes are treated equally and we can understand and learn about all the different ways of communication. I think the only thing I'd add to that is, is the fact that individuals that we need to, that neurodivergent ideas that we need to be mindful of, that we, we're engaged in people and we engage in social, social interactions or develop relationships with people who are like-minded to us, who have similar interests, who have similar passions. What's the difference between a neurotypical and a neurodivergent forming relationships with other individuals. And I think, you know, it's, we need to, there's a kind of a myth about this idea of passions or interests that often autistic people have. And the people want to diversify away from a passion or an interest. It's like, you know, we don't say if somebody lo loves the rugby at the weekend and talk about the rugby that that's kind of an odd, an odd thing to talk about because there's a complete um there's a there's a collaboration there's a connection between those individuals if somebody wants to talk about like i could talk about um you know being a mom 24 7 you know i'm going to find like-minded people who are a mom to me um or who engage in kind of the same aspect it's no different for every individual for any individual and i think we need to kind of move away from this whole idea of that we can support neurodivergent individuals engage in their passions and that's how social interactions ultimately form good point okay um another question which i suppose kind of connects is um some autistic people don't see themselves as having a disability do you think we need to reconsider the terminology used in society i think we need to consider why disability is considered a negative thing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to look a lot more at embracing the social model of disability and sort of what society needs to do to change, to make life easier for autistic people or other otherwise disabled people. Do you want to give us a quick explanation of what the social model of disability is? Does anyone um, like so the social model of dis disability is basically saying that a person, um, while they may have say disability related to pain and such, but they're mainly disabled by society not being will willing to change and adapt to meet their needs. Great. I, I, I think that's the best I can ex can explain it anyway. <laughs> A good excellent. Does anyone else want to come in on that one? No. Okay, I'll move on. Uh, the next one's for Kirsten. Um, any comments about how an autistic woman working in a university might be able to access accommodations in the workplace? Um, I suppose register or make sure HR knows that you you have the diagnosis because then you have the the kind of protections that are inherent in being disabled, using that word, in the workplace. Um, but I suppose just from my own experience, having like a mentor that you can speak to, someone who is aware of autism and kind of the challenges that you might have can be really, really helpful. And even somebody that you can just kind of 
double check things with um, because sometimes things can be a bit confusing um, when people are involved. So being able to to kind of double check things with people just to make sure you've understood it properly um, can be reassuring. But um, I think if you can find evidence for the accommodations that you might need, that kind of strengthens your argument if you're going to be going to someone and kind of asking for accommodations. But I suppose something that I found a bit difficult was the fact that a lot of accommodations for autism aren't necessarily very concrete. So like, if I was using a wheelchair, I could say, look, I need this ramp. It's a physical kind of concrete thing. I need this, can you give this to me? Whereas for some of the challenges, if you're autistic, they can be a bit more nebulous. So it's a bit harder to explain, first of all, what the challenge is, and then following up from that, what someone can do to actually kind of um, support someone. And then that, that's the reason I included that quote in the presentation was to kind of highlight that even if someone's very, very willing to make accommodations like it has to be this kind of ongoing negotiation between people and you have to keep kind of I suppose taking responsibility for yourself and understanding your own challenges and all the work that's involved in that and then the other person you know your manager or the, the people that you're working with kind of have to engage in that a bit as well so sorry I don't have a very straightforward simple answer to that but you know, could I also add something Yes. Um, a lot of the funding that universities get for reason reasonable accommodation is given to undergraduate students. There's not often a lot of funding for reasonable accommodations for staff. Um, I know sometimes the universities have to actually apply to get that funding for the individual staff member. So there can sometimes be a little bit of difficulty getting the reasonable accommodation if there is a monitor monetary aspect involved. Um, so kind of we need to focus on all levels. Yeah, like I know a lot of universities are trying to change this. They're trying to bring in the funding to get it, to get, to be able to provide those reasonable accommodations. But it, it, it is something that's underway rather than something that's already there. Okay. Did anyone else want to say anything on that? Oh, okay. Um, next one is, I work with teenagers on the spectrum. I try to emphasize the skills needed and be very positive in supporting them to get a part-time job, but I'm really struggling to get them and their parents motivated. Any tips? Um, Claire, maybe come in on that one. I think you kind of have to consider is like that, yeah, we do when we look at the research we do consider that it's important to start building experiences early on because those experiences are useful in terms of we all learn through experiential learning and it supports us um into life i think it's about you know kirsten referred it to in her presentation as well is is that do we always need to push people into employment is employment people's choice do they want to be employed um, and is that the decision of the person who's supporting the individual or is that the goal of the individual themselves and I think you have to go back to the goal of the individual themselves what do they want to do and that is really unique because you are really going to be at a stumbling block if you're trying to push one agenda and the other person has a very different agenda because therefore that therapeutic rapport is going to be um, you know uh, ch really challenged in that aspect I think what we need to consider is, is people's, you know, interests. What are people's desires? What do they want to engage in? Uh, where do they see themselves into the future? Discussing those elements, I think, are really can be really important, but not necessarily pushing a person into it because we have a preconceived image that um, employment is super duper important. Um, you know, sometimes people have to like my slide people have to take U-turns, people have to go in different directions, people have to learn from those experiences themselves and make those decisions. And we talk about it, I suppose, in mental health practice, we talk about the idea of risk and choice. And risk and choice are really, really important for individuals to make decisions for themselves. And it's not risk as in, 
safety risk, but in, we, we all make estimated risk or guesstimated risks, or we make a sense of choice and those choices are what will lead us to ultimately where we may want to go or will move us in a different, in a different path. Um, and I suppose that's really important uh, to consider or explaining maybe to the person, maybe what is the, the situation around employment and is, is that something they want to pursue into the future and maybe starting that conversation, but not necessarily pushing the person into employment is the way to maybe think about it. That's just some of my initial thoughts. I'm sure I could come up with more uh, at another point, but just there off, off the bat at the moment. Yeah, I, I would agree. Can I jump in for a second? I think the intrinsic motivation is so important, all right. Um, but I think also like looking at the time period, um, coming out of secondary school, moving into college can often be a time of burnout or autistic inertia for people, for teens who have really pushed themselves, really struggled, you know, to get through the Leaving Cert. The same, at the, the, those kind of crucial life stages coming out of college into employment. Again, you need to look out for, for that. And that's where, like, if you have, as, as Claire has already said so perfectly, um, you know, if you're trying to push an agenda on a child or their, their parents are, it's not going to work unless they're intrinsically motivated, but you do need to consider they may be burnt out and they may just need a break. Um, but then also just like a quick, you know, tip, I would suggest have a look at the VIA, VIA character.org. And um, the VIA character.org is a strengths based um, free, um, sorry, questionnaire that anybody can do. And um, I think that's a really useful tool if you're working with teens or adults or anybody or any of us to just have an idea of what our strengths are, what motivates, motivates us and energizes it. And it's always you know, worthwhile and easier to work with our strengths and against them. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think as well that if, if a person has a particular career goal in mind or a particular role that they want to work towards, if you can kind of highlight how these jobs that are immediately available can help them work towards that particular thing, like developing a certain skill, um, that kind of thing. It can be kind of easier to understand then, well, why, why should I take this job that, you know, I don't really want to do and it doesn't pay very well, but you can see then that you can build on that and move on. Like not everybody, well, most people won't be able to walk straight into the job that they really want with the pay that they really want. Like you do have to, to kind of scaffold towards that. So if you can explain in kind of more concrete terms, okay, you know, you might not like this, this and this, but doing this will look great on your CV and it will help you improve these kinds of skills. And um, what I find is, you know, if you can do volunteering or you know, even just part-time jobs, demonstrate to employers you know that you've got motivation and that you can deal with people or you know obviously it depends on the role that you want to go into but like not having a blank cv is going to put you ahead of people when you're going for jobs anyway so even though it could be difficult at the time to think okay how is this actually going to help me towards what i want to do if you can kind of even pick out one thing it can be a bit more motivating for the person that all sounds really interesting so i'm hearing intrinsic motivation is important and then letting them lead and then highlighting the stepping stones to the destination so you know what they're about did you want to say anything on that elaine um so i think sometimes it's good to highlight that stepping stones aren't always straightforward like just as, as mentioned earlier by other people, there is a presumption that, you know, people are going to go from leaving cert straight to undergraduate degree or whatever, but there's also maybe people who, who leave school early, who maybe go into, you know, level six degree or who choose to just go straight into employment. And then eventually they might come back to say, actually, this field really interests me. Like, they might decide after a few years of working, they're starting to get an interest in education or something similar to that and come back to college as a postgraduate student. But there's also, there's also people who, like the formal education system just isn't for them. And currently there's not, I feel a lot of, a lot of options for progression within professions without the formal education. Like 
Hi, my, we're talking about this currently in the library profession. Um, as I said in my talk, finance is a big issue for a lot of people trying to get into college. And for us, for a long time, even to work as a library assistant, you needed a, a degree. So there's not a lot, I can tell you from work experience, there's not a lot covered in that degree that you can't learn on the job. Like we're currently considering the possibility of traineeships um, to say that maybe a person can start work with us and attend say classes as part of work that they can build up what someone might learn in, in the formal degree process. So, sorry, I'm not praising that very well, <laughs> but I, I hope the, I hope what I'm trying to say is coming through. But university isn't always the way to go to where you need to go. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's nearly all we have time for this evening. But um, I wanted to ask you all for maybe a final point, or maybe there's something that you want to say that I haven't asked about or you haven't had a chance. So if anyone wants to come in on that. Um, I suppose what I can't remember who was just saying that there about how it doesn't have to be a straight path, like a typical path. Like I know I went to college and then had to go back and do my leaving cert to go to college again in Ireland. So I was in college in the UK. So I definitely have a zigzag kind of way to getting to employment and that sometimes it is like you don't have to have a big grand goal in mind. Um, but you need to to recognize your own strengths and um you know even if you do have challenges in work th there's so much that you especially if you are autistic like someone said about in the the comments about the the strengths and stuff i did had have a slide on strengths but i took it out because i didn't have enough time to talk about it but you know there is so much that you can bring as an individual with autism to your work that you know you just have to kind of believe in that a little bit um, even if it does get a bit challenging at times. That's my attempt at being inspirational and motivational. <laughs> so there you go. Anyone else? No? I, did, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to, to chat and talk to, and get to be with these fabulous women talking about all this. So I think it's it really is helpful to see what's being achieved um and yeah i think it's just the ongoing work then i would i would i would beg that we all do the ongoing work of reflexivity of watching out for our own internalized ableism anytime for me anyway and anytime i think um that i need to fix something or fix you know a situation or a person or anything like that then obviously i'm veered into ableism so i think that's like a really good kind of thing to keep in, in our own minds with ourselves and and with our clients brilliant okay thanks for that um and thank you for all your participation they were really interesting uh, i can't wait to listen to them all back again and be able to process them all fully when i'm not so nervous um and that is all we have time for this evening and indeed as part of this three part learning exchange series i want to sincerely thank all our wonderful contributors in this evening's event and to those who participated in our previous events. I want to thank our attendees who have enhanced each of our webinars with your thoughtful questions and suggestions. Finally, I want to pay tribute to, our, to my fellow members of the organizing committee featuring representatives of the PSI Autism Special Interest Group, the Psychology Department of Lucina Clinic Services and the St. John of God's Research Foundation who deliver this event as part of their learning exchange series. I'm now going to hand over to Leslie O'Hara from St. John of God to say a few words. Thanks very much, Jessica. Um, my name is Leslie. I'm the general manager of the St. John of God Research Foundation. And really, I just wanted to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the organizing committee that have worked so tirelessly behind the scenes for not just the last three weeks, but really the last six months or so in bringing this together. 
Um, I'm glad that they finally had the opportunity to emerge from the shadows and turn on their cameras because you usually don't get to see them. Um, so I, I do want to, say, to, to mention them by name. Uh, we have Sonia Morris, Claude Nivuelon, Ashley McKenna and Neve Doody, who represent St. John of God and the psychology department of Lucina Clinic Services, and also have membership of the PSI as well, I should say. Um, we have Barry Murphy and Jacintha McComish um, from the Autism Special Interest Group of the PSI. And of course, the person at the helm of this evening's proceedings and has expertly chaired and guided us through the way is Jessica Doyle. Um, Jessica, you did a fantastic job chairing and keeping everyone to time. You led a very engaging discussion panel this evening. So thank you for that. But I also have to say, uh, Jessica has been a driving force behind this series. Um, she chaired tonight. She gave um, a fantastic presentation last week. But in addition to that, she's been securing these speakers and the, the events wouldn't have been as successful if we didn't have the caliber of presenters that we had. So Jessica, along with the rest of the committee has played a great role in, in getting those guests on board and um, in assisting uh, guests in preparing their talks. I know Jessica has spent some time giving video, video technique advice to people. Um, she's also spent late nights editing videos. And I know that because we get some messages late at night <laughs> when she's doing her final edits. Um, and she's done that without any complaint through the whole process. Um, and, and also has maintained a very quiet, passionate approach, um, which I think has just been, for me, it's been inspirational. I've learned a huge amount from working with Jessica and working with the SIG and the rest of the organizing committee. This is a topic I was familiar with, but I really think I, I was actually very ignorant of until this webinar was put together. Um, it's been the first of the Learning Exchange series delivered by uh, the St. John of God Research Foundation, but it wouldn't have happened without the partnership that we established with the, the psychology department in Lucina and with um, the SIG, of course, from the PSI. We've had over the last three weeks, over 1500 people uh, register for these events or try to register. We've had waiting lists for, for each week as well. It's clearly a hugely important topic to people. And we've, uh, we've been able to shine a spotlight on some of the topics, but I think there's definitely an appetite there for more. And I'm hoping that we'll continue our collaboration between St. John of God and the PSI so that we can keep advocating um, and we can keep the, the spotlight on this topic. And if there's anything that we haven't covered over the last three weeks, and I'm sure there's a multitude of things, um, you can get in touch with us and we'll try and run more of these because I, I definitely think it's something that there is an appetite for. And also we're passionate about it. I think that we have a responsibility to, to continue it and to keep it on the agenda. So on my behalf and on behalf of St. John of God, thank you to our organizing committee. And I send you all and to our attendees a virtual round of applause. So that's back to you now, Jessica, to close the event. I concur. And I have enjoyed this event, these series of events immensely. So just a few points. Um, recordings from all three events are available online and details of how to access the recordings can be found in the event booklet that you were emailed. And finally, a reminder that if you require CPD points, you should email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie. Take care and good night. <laughs>